to the fir our first Table Read Tuesday, where we read the classic film Casablanca. It's, you know, made 80 years ago, but it still has quotable lines that people quote today. And I'm your host, Jacob Patrick, and I have 20 years of experience in the animation and entertainment industry. And we'll introduce you to the other wonderful actors that we have here to help us read this classic script. So starting in the upper left corner, Yvonne. Hi, yes, I, my name is Ash and I am an actor, oh, an improviser, sorry. director, writer, voiceover artist from Canada. Great, and Mary Lou. Hi, my name is Mary Lou Drakenberg and I started in this industry somewhere around when I was in worked as an actor, producer, casting, you name it, voiceover artist, dancer, choreographer, and yeah, still in this wow. industry many years later. That's impressive. Yeah, wow. Tony. Hello, I'm Tony Flora, and I've been doing mostly theater since high school. I just got into a little bit of voiceover work and um, some film. So... This is going to be fun. I look forward to it. Thank you for asking me here. Yes, happy to have everyone. Craig. Hi there, I'm Craig Scott. I'm all the way from Canada as well. I've been acting on stage, producing, directing for the past 20 some odd years. Awesome. Andrew. Hey, everyone. Nice to meet you all. My name is Andrew Garrett. Um, I'm an actor, I'm born and raised in Los Angeles, still here. Um, I, you know, film and theater actor and been doing it, you know, most of my life. That's awesome. Justin. Hi, my name is Justin Dobby. I'm from Los Angeles and I make words, voices and sound with my vocal cords. And sometimes <laughs> people pay me to do it. That's great. All right. Good yeah. value. It's worth it, no matter what they pay. Uh, all right, narrator. Narrator. I'm Angel or Angelina Peterson, up in Canada, and I've been acting since in my twenties, and I'm a little older than that now. So, um, just getting into writing, and I'm happy to be here. Awesome. And here in Cipher Studios, we have Clint. Hey, everybody. How's it going? Um, I'm actually just getting started. So uh, when I was a kid, I was in the school play, but I was uh, the bad child and my teacher punished me for that by not letting me do plays. So I just been the class clown and now the workplace clown for a while and I want to get into the entertainment industry. So here I am uh, eternally grateful for everybody for showing up and thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. And Jason. Jason Steele. I'm from Red Deer, Alberta, Canada, and uh, I'm looking forward to tonight. This is a lot of fun. I've done a few uh, virtual table reads and directed them, and uh, this is kind of fun to act in one here, so I'm looking forward to it. All right. Awesome. And uh, Mackenzie Kahn, she just went off for a moment. She'll be back on to read the role of Ilsa. Oh, here she is. Hi, Mackenzie, you you're me? back. We can hear you. Oh, thank and God. we're doing our introduction, so please... Give us your brief intro. Hi, I'm Mackenzie Kahn. Um, I am an actor and a poet of all kinds, musician. Um, I've known Jacob for uh, probably over a decade now. Uh, wow. And uh, I'm from Detroit, Michigan, represent. All right, that's excellent. And without further ado, I say we get started on this classic film, Essential Reading. <laughs> All right, so I'll bring it up and share the screen. <laughs> All about you. Hello. <laughs> I'm not the narrator. <laughs> All right, there we go. Casablanca, screenplay by Julius J. Epstein and Philip G. Epstein and Howard Koch. And uh, it was based on like an unproduced uh, play um, if you guys have not seen it, again, so much credit to Michael Curtis and everyone, like, it's phenomenal. We'll provide the link. It's currently streaming on HBO, um, and I think you can watch it also on YouTube, elsewhere. 
Wait, but wait, what? It is Warner amazing. Brothers owns Casablanca? I never knew. <laughs> I know this is one that you see the producer's name, and it's it actually says like one of the Warner Brothers. So, all right. Drink our water. There we go. And this, for anyone starting in screenwriting, this is more of a shooting script, and it isn't in the, the traditional format today that people write as spec scripts. So things will look a little different with the numbers on the left. All right, so there you go. Fade in, long shot, revolving globe. As the globe revolves, it becomes animated. Long lines of people in miniature stream from all sections of Europe to converge upon one point on the tip of Africa. Over this animated scene comes a voice of a narrator. Refugees streaming from all corners of Europe toward the freedom of the new world. All eyes turn toward Lisbon, the great embarkation point. But now everyone, everybody could get to Lisbon directly. So a refugee trail sprang up. Which illustrates the trail as the narrator mentions the points. Paris to Marseille, across the Mediterranean to, to Iran, then, then by train or auto or foot, across the rim of Africa to Casablanca in French Morocco. Relief map of Casablanca showing the ocean on one side and the desert on the other. The voice of the narrator comes over. Here, the fortunate ones through money or influence or luck obtain exit vis visas and scurry to Lisbon and from Lisbon to the Americas. But the others wait in Casablanca and wait and wait. As the narrator's voice fades away, close shot, relief map of Casablanca, a street on the map. All right. And... At first, only the turrets and rooftops are visible against the turret sky. In the distance is a haze enveloped sky. The camera pawns down and the facades of the Moorish buildings to a narrow, twisting street crowded with polyglot life of native quarter. The intense desert sun holds the scene in a torpid tranquility. Activity is unhurried and the sounds are muted. Suddenly, the screech of a siren shatters the calm. Veiled women run screaming for shelter. Street vendors, beggars, and urchins melt into doorways. Police cars speed into shop and pulls up before an old-fashioned Moorish hotel. Floppy, flop house would be a better word for it. Interior corridor. On the decrepit hotel, native French police officers run up the steps, crash into the doors and the various rooms come out dragging frightened refugees. Close shot of the door as one police officer flings it open. The shadow of a man hanging by a rope from a chandelier is seen on the wall. The officer slams the door shut. Street corner, two other policemen have stopped a white civilian and are talking to him. May we see your papers, please? Uh, no, I, I don't think I have them on me. I, uh... In that case, we'll have to ask you to come along. Uh, no, no, it's possible that I, no, no, yeah, yeah, no, here they are. He brings out his papers. The second policeman examines them. These papers expired three weeks ago. You'll have to... Suddenly, the civilian breaks away, starts to run wildly down the street. The camera trucks with him. From off scene, we hear the policeman shout, halt, halt but the civilian halt, keeps halt. going. A shot rings out. The man fit falls. Jan and Anina Bandel are huddled in the doorway. The dazed and frightened specter spectators to this casual tragedy. They are a Austrian couple, a very young and attractive, thrust by circumstances from a simple country life into an unfamiliar, hectic world. Anina's hand clutches her husband's arm as their eyes follow up the police who are examining the victim. They both speak with a Central European accent. At this moment, the police car sweeps past them on its way back. Jan takes his wife by the hand. Uh, the prefecture must be this way. They start off in the di direction taken by the police car. An <clears throat> inscription, Liberté, Egalito Fratern Night. I apologize for any bad speaking. Carved in the marble block along the roof line of the building, the camera pans down the facade, French in architecture, to a high, to the high vaulted entrance 
over which is inscribed, Palais de Justice. Camera continues to pan down the entrance. A queue of people of all ages and nationalities overflow from inside the building and down the steps. The camera pans over the line of waiting people extending into the square. We pick up a babel of languages with only a few recognizable words, such as visa, monsieur le prefet, Portugal, a hundred francs, etc. Suddenly the attention of the people is attracted toward the street. The square is typically French in its landscaping and architecture. This is the center of the modern city of Casablanca. The police car is just pulling up to the curb in front of the prefecture. A policeman opens the grated door and at the back of the car and a nondescript assortment of refugees begin to pour out. Sidewalk cafe on one side of the square, a middle-aged English couple are standing in front of their table for a better view of the commotion in front of the prefecture. A dark visaged European smoking a cigarette leans against a lamppost a short distance away. He is watching the English couple more closely than a scene on the street. What earth is going on here? Pardon, madame, have you not heard? We hear very little. We understand even less. Two German couriers were found murdered in the desert. The unoccupied desert. In front of the Palais de Justice, a refugee, as the refugees are unloaded from the police car. This is the customary roundup of refugees, liberals, and, of course, a beautiful young girl from Monsieur Renal, the prefect of police. The sidewalk cafe. As usual, refugees and the liberals will be released in a few hours. A girl will be released later. What? A woman is safe in such a wretched place. To get out of Casablanca, they say one needs two hundred dollars for an exit visa, and two hundred for the prefect. Unless, of course, one is a beautiful rich girl. The rich and the beautiful sail to Lisbon. The poor, oh, they're always with us. Dreadful. Unfortunately, along these unhappy refugees, the scum of Europe has gravitated to Casablanca. Some of them have been waiting years for a visa. Monsieur, I beg of you, watch yourself. Take care. Be on guard. Uh, 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 Thank you, thank you, uh, thank you very much. No, no, <clears throat> bonjour, madame. Bonjour, monsieur. He walks out of the shot, the Englishman still a trifle disconcerted by the European's action after him, mopping his brow with his pocket handkerchief. A friendly chap, wasn't he? <laughs> As he pats his breast pocket, there is something lacking. He opens his coat, fills inside, <laughs> Uh, silly of me. <laughs> mm. um, I'm leaving my wallet in my hotel room. Oh. He, he closes his coat, then suddenly he see, looks off in the direction of the departing dark European, the clouds of suspicion gathering. But now overhead, the drone of a low-flying airplane is heard. Heads look up. Airplane flying overheard, its motor cut for a landing, plane showing the swastika on it, its tail. Along the waiting line of refugees outside the police de justice, their upturned gaze follows the flight of the plane. In their faces is revealed one hope they all have in common, and the plane is the symbol of that hope. The camera stops at the last of the line, far out the street, just as Jan and Anina appear and take their places at the very end. Their eyes also follow the droning plane. Anina. Perhaps tomorrow we shall be on the plane. Jan smiles at his wife the with the superior knowledge. The airport, the plane is swooping down past the neon sign 
on a building on the edge of the airport. The sign reads Ricks. Captain Louis Renal, the French officer appointed by Vinci as prefect of the police in Casablanca, stands chatting with the other officers. He is a handsome, middle-aged Frenchman, debonair and gay, but with all a shrewd and alert official <clears throat> around him are clustered. The German consul, Herr Heinz, a young Italian officer, Captain Tonelli, and Renault's aide, Lieutenant Cassel. Behind them is a detail of French native soldiers. The officers watch the approaching plane as it taxis toward them. The German and Italian detach themselves from the group and walk toward the place where the plane will stop. The German walks briskly as they step ahead of the Italian who appears to be making an effort to catch up. The plane with a swastika over the door, when the door opens, the first passenger to step out is a large German wearing heavy horn rimmed <clears throat> spectacles. He is bland faced with a perpetual smile that seems more the result of a frozen face muscle than a cheerful disposition. On any occasion, when Major Strasser is crossed, the smile melts into the expression that hardens into iron. Herr Heinz steps to him with upraised arm. Heil Hitler. Heil Hitler. They shake hands. It is good to be the same. Thank you. Thank you. Strasser turns to greet Manal and Cassel, who have come into the shop. Her hands makes the introduction. May I present Captain Renal, police prefect of Casablanca, Major Strasser. The two shake hands. Unoccupied farm, so welcomes you to Casablanca. Thank you, Captain. It's very good to be here. Captain Tonelli of the Italian staff, at your service, sir. That is kind of you. Our staff is anxious to cooperate. Major, may I present my aide, uh, Lieutenant Cassel? Cassel does not offer her to shake hands. The mirror merely salute and bow. For now, leads Stresser toward the edge of the airfield where the cars await them. Heinz and Cassel follow, with the Italian captain left to bring up the rear. Walking toward the cars. Renault. You may find the climate of Casablanca tight for warm, Major. Oh, we Germans must be uh, used to all climates, from Russia to Sa the Sahara. But perhaps you are not referring to the weather. <laughs> what else, uh, my dear Major? <laughs> uh, by the way, the murders of the couriers, what has been done? Well, realizing the importance of the case, my men are rounding up twice the usual number of suspects. Again, Strasser looks at him sharply. Captain Renal means that the roundup uh, is a blind. We already know who the murderer is. Good. Is he in custody? There's no way. No, tonight uh, he will come to Rick's. Uh, everybody comes to Rick's. Heinz shrugs to indicate that he can do nothing with Renault. I have already heard about this cafe. I've also heard Monsieur Rick himself. As they arrive at the car, uh, Rick's car drives up. Uh, okay, we'll go. Electric sign of Rick's, night. Entrance to Rick's. Rick's car drives up. People in the background enter the cafe through the revolving door. From the cafe, we hear sounds of music and laughter. Interior Rick's boom shot an expensive and chic nightclub, which definitely possesses an air of sophistication and intrigue. The camera pans around the room, soaking in the atmosphere. A four-piece orchestra is playing. The piano is small, salmon-colored, instrument on wheels. There is a Negro on the stool. He is dressed in bright blue slacks and a sport shirt. He is playing and singing. About him, there is a hum of voices, chatter and laughter. The occupants of the room are varied. There are Europeans in their dinner jackets, there are women beautifully begowned and bejeweled. There are Moroccans in silk robes, Turks wearing friars, Levantines, naval officers, members of the Foreign Legion distinguished by their copus. Across the room, stretching the entire length of the wall is a tremendous resplendent bar. The camera holds on Sam singing with orchestra in the background, then pans up 
pans to close up on customers. Waiting, waiting. I'll never get out of here. Oh, I'll die in Casablanca. I can't stand, I can't stand, it. stand it. Oh, there, there. <laughs> Camera pans and holds on Sam as he finishes a number, close up on a woman and more, a well-dressed woman talking to more. She has a bracelet on her wrist, no other jewelry. But can't you make it just a little more, please? I'm sorry, madame. The diamonds are a drug on the market. Everybody sells diamonds. There are diamonds everywhere. 2,400. All oh, right. The more hands her the money, she gives him her bracelet. Two conspirators are talking. The trucks are waiting. The men are waiting. It's the fishing smack, Santiago. It uh, leaves at one tomorrow night here from the end of La Medina, the third boat. Thank you. Oh, thank you. And bring the 15,000 francs in cash. Remember. In cash! The camera dollies to the bar. As the camera passes the various tables, we hear a babble of foreign tongues. Here and there, we catch scattered phrases or sentences in English. Now we are at the bar. A huge, jovial-looking person. He wears a silk smock. He hands a drink to a customer with the Russian equivalent of bottoms up. Then he calls out to the passing waiter. Carl. The waiter stops, turns to the bar. He is a small, mild-mannered man with spectacles. Sacha places several drinks on a tray and instructs Carl about delivering them. C Carl, tray in hand, walking up to a private door over which a burly man stands guard. Oh, oh, open up, Abdul. Yes, sir, Professor. Carl goes in. Interior gambling room, as Carl comes in, the camera takes in the activity at the various tables, then... A woman hands a check to the dealer. He, in turn, turns around and hands it on an, an overseer who looks at the check, then to the woman. Just one moment, please. He walks towards a table. A man's hand holding a drink. We see the overseer's body come into the scene. His hand places a check on the table. The other man's hand picks up the check. Obviously, the man is studying the check. Then his hand comes into the scene, and on the back of the check in pencil, he writes, Okay, Rick. The overseer's hand takes the check as Rick sitting at the table alone. He sits staring at the drink. There is no expression in his eyes. He is a complete deadpan. Rick is an American of indeterminate age. At a table, the women are two men and a woman, two women and a man. The women are glancing off screen at Rick's table, fascinated. Carl is in the scene preparing the Turkish coffee. Will you ask Rick if he'll have a drink with us? Madame, he, he never drinks with customers, never unless he invites them to his table. Oh, what makes saloon keepers so snobbish? Well, perhaps if I told them that I learned the second largest bank in Amsterdam. That wouldn't impress Rick. The leading banker in Amsterdam is now the pastry chef in our kitchen, and his father is the bellboy. He takes the bill from the man's hand and walks away. Camera pans with him, disclosing. Medium shot Rick. Uh, I'll take this one, great. He is glancing towards the open door and indicating that the person seeking admittance is not to be let in. There is a commotion at the door. A voice with a German accent is heard shouting. A vote on you! Do you think you are? Rick gets up and with no change of expression, walks across the floor to the door, camera trucking with him. Uh, a red faced German. I know there's no gambling in here. Yeah. I know there's gambling in here. There's no secret. You dare not let me out of here. You dare not keep me out of here. Yes. What's the trouble? Uh, this uh, gentleman. I've been in every gambling hall between Honolulu and Berlin. And if you think I'm going to be kept out of a saloon like this, you're very much mistaken. 
As Ugarte comes in, he is a small, thin man with a nervous air. If he were an American, he would look like a tout. He is interestingly in the direction of Rick's, Rick and the German. Oh, excuse me, please. Hello, Rick. Rick just looks at the German calmly, takes the card out of the German's hand. The cash is good at the bar. What? Do you know who I am? I do. You're lucky the bar is open to you. This is outrageous. I will report you to a grave. He turns away from the sputtering German, catches the Negro's eye at the piano. A Negro who will, while still playing, has been watching the byplay, winks at Rick. Rick acknowledges the wink with some friendly gesture. It isn't quite a smile, but it is probably the closest thing to a smile that Rick can manage. Anyways, it establishes the fact that as far as Rick is concerned, the Negro is a privileged person. Rick goes back into the bar. Gambling room. As Rick comes into the scene, a moment later, Ugarte follows him into the scene. There is nobody near them. Oh, you know, Rick, watching you just now with the Deutsche Bank, one would think you had been doing this all your life. What makes you think I haven't? Oh, oh, nothing. When you first came to Casablanca, I thought... You thought what? What right have I to think? Too bad about those German couriers, wasn't it? Yeah, they got a break. Yesterday there were just two German clerks. Today they're the honored dead. You will forgive me for saying this, Monsieur Rick, but you are a very cynical person. Forgive you. Bartender coming to the scene with two drinks, which he sets before the men. Uh, uh. Thank you. Will you have a drink with me, please? No. You despise me, don't you? If I gave you any thought, I probably would. You object to the kind of business I do. But think of the poor refugees who must rot in this place if I did not help them. Is it so bad that through ways of my own, I provide them with Exit visas? For a price, Ugarte. For a price. But think of those poor devils who, who cannot meet another price. I, I get it for them for half. Is that so parasitic? Rick turns to look at Ugarte. I don't mind a parasite. I object to a cut rate one. Well, after tonight, I am through with the whole business. Rick. I am leaving Casablanca. Who did you bribe for your visa? Renault or yourself? <laughs> myself. I found myself much more reasonable. Who do you know what this is? Something that not even you have ever seen. Letters of transit signed by Marshal Wagand. They cannot be rescinded. Not even questioned. Rick looks at him, then holds out his hand for the envelope. <laughs> One moment. Tonight, I will sell these for more money than even I have a dream of. Then, farewell to Casablanca. Rick, I have many friends in Casablanca, but because you despise me, you're the only one I trust. Will you keep these letters for me? For how long? Perhaps an hour, perhaps longer. I don't want them here overnight. Don't be afraid of that. Please keep them for me. Thank you. I know I could trust you. Mm. Waiter coming into the scene. Oh, waiter, I am expecting some People, if anyone asks for me, I will be here. The waiter nods, leaves. Ugarty turns to Rick. Rick, I hope you are more impressed with me. If you'll forgive me, I'll share my good luck with your roulette wheel. 
He starts across the floor. Wait a minute. Yeah. Your guardian stops. Rick comes up to him. Rick's voice is barely audible. I heard a rumor that those German couriers were carrying letters of Trent. Ugardi doesn't reply for a moment. Yes. I heard that rumor too. Poor devils. Rick looks at Ugardi steadily. You're right, Ugarte. I am a little more impressed with you. Ugardi smiles and almost swaggers towards the gambling table. Rick starts for the door. Sam is playing and singing the knock on wood number, accompanied by the orchestra. The cafe is in semi-darkness. The spotlight is on Sam. And every time the orchestra comes to the knock on wood business, the spotlight swings over to the orchestra. Rick, as he makes his way from the gambling room to Sam on the floor, at the piano, Rick comes into the shop. And during one of the periods when the spotlight is on the orchestra, Rick slips the letters of transit into the t piano. The exit toward, then exits toward the, bra the bar. At the bar, Rick comes in and watches Sam in his number. Ferrari, Ferrari, he sees Rick at the bar and exits in his direction. Ferrari comes in two shot. Hello, Rick. Hello, Ferrari. How's business at the Blue Parrot? Fine, but I would like to buy your cafe. It's not for sale. You haven't heard my offer. It's not for sale at any price. Uh, Ferrari size. What do you want for Sam? I don't buy or sell human beings. That's too bad. That's Casablanca's lead commodity. In refugees alone, we can make a fortune if you would work with me through the black market. Suppose you let me run my business and you run yours. Suppose we should ask Sam. Maybe he'd like to make a change. Suppose we do. At the piano, he has just finished his number. Rick and Ferrari come up to him. Sam Ferrari wants you to work for him at the Blue Parrot. Sam answers. What do we have, Sam? Ah, I like it. I like it fine here. We'll double what I pay you. I ain't got time to spend what I make here. Sorry, Ferrari. Rick looks at Ferrari, smiles, shakes his head. Then he winks at Sam. Ferrari exits. Yvonne is sitting on a stool drinking brandy. Sasha, who is looking at her with love -stick sick eyes, is filling her tumbler. The boss is private stock because Yvonne, I love you. Oh, shut up. For you, Yvonne, I shut up. Rick saunters into the scene, leans against the bar next to Yvonne, but he pays no attention to her. She looks at him bitterly, without saying a word. Oh, Monsieur Rick, some Germans, boom, 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 uh, gave this check. Is it all right? Rick looks o the check over. In the midst of the number, uh, Sam is in the midst of a number, and Rick and Yvonne, as only <coughs> Sam is spotlighted at the piano, Rick and Yvonne stand in the gloom. Yvonne, who has never taken her eyes off Rick, finally blurts out. Where were you last night? Well, it's so long ago, I don't remember. Pause. Will I see you tonight? I never planned that far ahead. Yvonne turns, looks at Sasha, extends her glass to him, and he is about to fill the glass. Rick turns, stops him with a gesture. Give me another. Sasha, she's had enough. Don't listen to him, Sasha. Fill it up. Sasha hesitates, looks at Rick. I love you, Yvonne, but he pays me. Yvonne wills on Rick with drunken fury. Rick, I am sick and tired of having Sasha. you. 
Call a cab. Yes, boss. Come on. He walks toward the cafe entrance. We're going Taking Yvonne by coat. the arm. Come on, we're going to get you a coat. Take your hands off me. He pulls her along toward the hall door. No, you're going home. You've had a little too much to drink. In front of Rick's, Sasha stands at the curb, signaling a cab. Finally, one pulls up. Rick and Yvonne come out of the cafe. He is putting a coat over her shoulders. She's objecting violently. <clears throat> Who do you think you are, pushing me around? What a fool I was to fall for a man like you. You go better, better go with her, Sasha. Be sure she gets home. Yes, boss. One on each arm, they help Yvonne in the cab. Sasha follows her in. Sasha, come right back. Yes, boss. The cab starts off. Rick, as he walks back into the cafe, he lights a cigarette. Here's Renal and walks toward him. Mm. Hello, Rick. Hello, Louis. It's how extravagant of you, throwing away women like that. Uh, someday, they may be very scarce. Renal is sipping on some brandy. His eyes are amused. Rick walks into the shop. You know, I think now I shall pay a call to Yvonne. Maybe get her on the rebound, eh? <laughs> when it comes to women, you're a true Democrat. Renal laughs, pours Rick a drink. There is the sound of a plane warming up on the adjacent airfield. Rick looks in the direction of the sound. Renal follows his gaze. Transport, Transport plane is the full glare of the, in the full glare of the floodlights, standing poised on the runway, its motors racing, ready for takeoff. Rick is still looking steadfastly at the plane. The plane to Lisbon, huh? You would like to be on it? Why, what's in Lisbon? The uh, clipper to America? Rick doesn't answer. Looks at the plane warming up, but his look isn't a happy one. I've often speculated on why uh, you would do not return to America. Did you abscond with the church farms? Did you run off with the uh, senator's wife? I should like to think that you killed a man, huh? <laughs> it is the uh, pessimist in me, I suppose. The combination of all three. Mm. And uh, what in heaven's name brought you to Casablanca? Hmm? The plane, the plane's motor grows louder. In my health. I came to okay. Casablanca for the waters. Waters? What waters? We are in the desert. <laughs> I was misinformed. Uh, Renal shakes his head, but can say nothing, for the plane is speeding down the runway. Its lights shine on the faces of Rick and Renal. Rick cannot take his eyes from the plane. Now it leaves the ground and passes almost directly over them. He watches the plane until its lights disappear into the distance. A coupier, Emil, so identified by the green visor over his eyes, comes into the scene. Excuse me, Monsieur Rick, uh, but uh, the gentleman inside the, uh, has won 20,000 francs. Uh, the cashier would like some money. Uh, well, I'll get it from the safe. I'm humiliated. Monsieur Rick, I do not understand how this it's is all possible. Right. Emil. Mistakes like that happen all the time. I'm awfully sorry. Rick and Renal both rise and start in. There's going to be some excitement around here tonight. We are going to make an arrest in your cafe. What, again? Uh, this cafe. is no ordinary arrest. Uh, a murderer, no less. Rick, as his eyes retract involuntarily, they glance toward the gambling room. They are starting for the steps alongside the bar. If you are thinking of warning him, I would not suggest it. Don't put yourself out. He, he can't possibly escape. 
I stick my neck out for nobody. Well, what's foreign policy? Ronell starts upstairs after Rick. You know, Rick, we could have made uh, this arrest earlier in the evening at the Blue Parrot. Rick enters a room on the landing. Interior Rick's office as he comes in, followed by Renal and Emil. But uh, out of my eye regard for you, we are staging it here. It will uh, amuse your customers. Our entertainment is enough. At door too small, to a small dark room off to the office where the safe is kept. Rick goes in, starts to open the safe. Renault, drink in hand, leans against the door jam. Rick, we are going to have an important guest tonight. Major Strasser from the Third Reich, no less. We want him to be here when we make the arrest. A little uh, demonstration of the efficiency of the administration. Mm -hmm. I see. And what's Strasser doing here? He doesn't come all the way to Casablanca to witness a demonstration of your efficiency. Perhaps not. Here you are. Oh, it should not happen again, <laughs> Monsieur. That's all right. Louis, you have something on your mind. Why don't you spill it? You're very observant. Now, as a matter of fact, I wanted to give you a word of advice. Yeah. Have a brandy. Oh, thank you, Rick. There are many exit visas sold in this cafe, but we know that you have never sold them. That is the reason why we permit you to remain open. Well, I thought it was because we let you win at roulette. Uh, that is another reason. Look, there is a man who has arrived here in Casablanca on his way to America. He will offer a fortune to anyone who will furnish him with an exit visa. Yeah, what's his name? Victor Laszlo. Victor Laszlo? Rick, this is the first time I've seen ever seen you impressed. Well, he's succeeded in impressing half the world. It is my duty to see that he does not impress the other half. Rick, Laszlo must never reach America. He stays in Casablanca. It will be interesting to see how he manages. Manages what? His escape. But I just told you, Stop. there is no... He escaped from a concentration camp and the Nazis have been chasing him all over Europe. This is the end of the chase. 20,000 francs says it isn't. Is that a serious offer? I just paid out 20,000 francs. I'd like to get it back. Make it 10,000. Uh, I am only a poor corrupt official. <laughs> Done. No matter how clever he is, he still needs an exit visa, or I should say, two. They start out of the room and down the steps, camera trucking with them. Why two? He is traveling with a lady? He'll take one. I think not. I have seen the lady, and if he did not leave her in Marseille, nor in Iran, he will not leave her in Casablanca. <laughs> Maybe he's not as romantic as you are. It does not matter. There is no exit visa for him. Louis, where did you get the idea I might be interested in helping Laszlo escape? Because, dear Ricky, I suspect that under that cynical shell, you are at art a sentimentalist. La love, if you will. But I happen to be familiar with your record. Let me point out two items. You fought with the Ethiopians against Italy, and you risked your neck with the royalists in Spain. I got we paid well for it on both occasions. Well, the winning side would have paid you more. Maybe. Apparently, you are determined to keep Laszlo here. I have my orders. Oh. I see. Gestapo spank. They are down now. As he speaks, he faces the huge mirror over the bar. 
you overestimate the influence of the Gestapo, Ricky. I do not interfere with them and they do not interfere with me. In Casablanca, I am master of my fate. I am captain of my ship. He I stops am short the... as his aide enters and speaks. Major Strausser is here, sir. Yeah. What you were saying? Uh, excuse me. He hurries towards Strausser. Rick smiles cynically and exits. Renal is walking with Carl. Carl, you see that Herr Strausser gets a good table close to the ladies. I have already given him the best, monsieur, knowing he is German and would take it anyway. <laughs> As they enter from the hall, Renal beckons to a nat native officer who is apparently waiting for a word. He approaches and salutes. Take him quietly, the uh, two guards at every door, okay? The native officer answers. Yes, sir. Everything is ready, sir. He salutes and starts towards the door of the gambling room. The camera travels with Vidal, who walks to the table on one side of the cafe where Strasser and Heinz are seated. At the adjoining table, there are some German officers. Strasser beams as Renal approaches the table. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening, Captain. Won't you join us? <laughs> Thank you. It is a pleasure to have you here, Major. Uh, champagne and a tin of caviar. Uh, may I recommend the Vue Clicquot? 26, a very good French wine. Thank you. Very well, sir. Very well, sir. <laughs> a very interesting club. Uh, inter especially so this evening, Major. In uh, just a minute, you will see the arrest of a man who murdered your couriers. I expect no less, Captain. Ugarte at the roulette table in the gambling room. Piled in in front of him is a huge stack of chips. He is having a run of luck, and his eyes are feverish as they follow the marble that is bouncing on the wheel. The marble stops on 13. Exultantly, Ugarte reaches for the chips, which the courier shoves on the table. But just then, another hand closes onto Ugarte's arm. A look of terror crosses his face. The native officer's voice overseen. Well, come with You'll me come with me. You got <gasps> Allow me to at least cash in my chips. <laughs> the native officer nods, follows Ugarty to the cashier. The cashier pays Ugarty the amount of his chips. Ugarty thrusts the money in his inside coat pockets. As his hand comes out of the pockets, he grips a small revolver pointed at the native officer. The officer makes a jump for Ugarty and the gun goes off. The officer clasps his shoulder. A woman screams. People at the gambling table duck for cover. Ugarty runs towards the hallway. Quick flashes. Rick, crossing the floor of the cafe, turns abruptly toward the door of the gambling room. A woman in a booth jumps to her feet, looks in the direction of the sound. A man, at the bar is lifting up his glass to drink. Abruptly, he puts the glass down. The music stops. Sam's hands holds the piano keys. Carl, behind the bar, flashes an expectant look towards Strasser's booth. Renal, Strasser, and Heinz all jump to their feet. Hallway behind the rooms, Ugarte rushes into the hallway as Rick appears from the opposite direction. Rick! Rick! Help me! Don't be a fool. Can't get away. Hide me! Do something! You must help me, Rick! Do something! Shut up! Before he can finish, Renault, Strasser, Heinz, and the others rush him from behind Rick. Other police officers appear from the gambling rooms, grab Ugarty. Without a word, Rick pushes away from him, pushes his way through the group to the cafe. Excellent, Captain. When they come to get me, Rick, I hope you'll be of more help. Stick my neck out for nobody. Rick comes out 
comes out on the floor. An air of tense expectancy pervades the room. A few customers are on the point of leaving. Rick speaks in a very calm voice. I'm sorry there was a disturbance, folks, but it's all over. Everything's all right. Just sit down and have a good time. Enjoy yourself. All right, Sam. At the piano, Sam nods and begins to play. Sam. Okay, boss. I think this is uh, Mary Lou. If you could play, read Sam. Oh, well, I get to be Sam now. Oh. Yes. Okay, boss. Oh, uh, well, Noah, would, would, the, would that do? Come on, folks. Old Noah, what he do? He waits and plays the next phrase. Taking in several tables, there's a half-hearted response from the people. Oh, no, what do you do? Oh, no, uh, what do you do? D that's right. Built a floating zoo. The people, under Sam's spell again, join in and sing. The gloom is somewhat lifted. We pan over various tables, picking up on all types of people during the curse of the song. Stressor's table, the song is finished and the excitement has quieted down. Renal, Strasser, and Heinz are now back at their table. Oh, Rick. Rick. Rick, Rick walks into the shot. Rick, this is uh, Major Heinrich Strasser of the Third Reich. <laughs> how do you do, Mr. Rick? Oh, how do you do? Uh, and you already know Air uh, Heinz of the Third Reich? Rick nods to Strasser and Heinz. Please, join us, Mr. Rick. Rick sits down beside Heinz, facing Renal and Strasser. Uh, Rick, uh, we are very honored tonight. Uh, Major Strasser is one of the reasons that the Third Reich enjoys the reputation uh, that it has today. Mm. You repeat the Third Reich, as though you expect there to be others. Well, uh, personally, uh, Major, I will take whatever comes. The waiter appears with drinks, begins to open the bottles and pour during the ensuing conversation. Do you mind if I ask a few questions? Unofficially, of course. Or make it official if you like. What is your nationality? Rick looks at him a moment before replying. I'm a drunkard. Strasser looks closely at him. Uh, that makes Rick a citizen of the world. <laughs> I was born in New York City, if that'll help you any. I understand you came here from Paris at the time of the occupation. That seems to be no secret. Are you one of those people who cannot imagine the Germans in their beloved Paris? Uh, it's not particularly my beloved Paris. <laughs> Can you imagine us in London? When you get there, ask me. And how about New York? There are certain sections of New York, Major, that I would not advise you to try to invade. Who do you think will win the war? More than the slightest idea. Rick is completely neutral about everything, uh, and that takes in the field of uh, women, too. <laughs> Strasser takes a little black book from his pocket, rifles through the pages. You weren't always so carefully neutral. We have a complete dossier on you. Richard Blaine, American? Age 37, cannot return to his country. The reason is very vague. We also know what you did in Paris. Also, Mr. Blaine, we know why you left Paris. Rick reaches over, takes the book from Strasser's hand. Don't worry, we're not going to broadcast it. Are my eyes really brown? 
<laughs> you will forgive my curiosity, Mr. Blaine. The point is, an enemy of the Reich has come to Casablanca, and we are checking on everyone who is possible or who can possibly help us. My interest in Victor Laszlo is staying or going is only a supporting one. In this case, I have no sympathy for the fox. Not uh, particular. I don't understand the hound's point of view, too. Victor Laszlo published the foulest lies in Prague newspapers until the very day we marched in. And that even after the continual print, scandalous sheets in the cellar. Of course, uh, one must admit he has great courage. I admit he is very clever. Three times he slipped through our fingers. In Paris, he continued his activities. We intend to not let that happen again. You excuse me, gentlemen. Your business is in politics. Mine is in running a saloon. Good evening, Mr. Blaine. Rick walks out of the shot toward the gambling room. You have nothing to worry about, Rick? Perhaps. The dark appearing foreigner we had seen in the opening sequence is busily engaged with a middle-aged, prosperous looking man. I beseech you, my friend. Be on guard. Take care. Use every precaution. Sam at the piano. He is idling away at something sentimental. The people at the tables have resumed their chatter. As he plays, Sam glances casually around suddenly. As his eyes look toward the entrance, his plane falters, then stops altogether. We see what Sam is staring at. A couple has just come in, and we recognize them as Victor Laszlo and his companion, whose face we saw in the car window outside of Ugarte's hotel. She wears a simple white gown. Her beauty is such that people turn and stare. The head waiter comes up to them. Yes, monsieur. I reserved a table, Victor Laszlo. Looking intently at Laszlo, who has the woman who has been looking around casually when she sees Sam, her face registers a startled surprise for just an instant. Yes, Monsieur Laszlo. Right this way. Sam, he sees her looking at him, turns his gaze away, resumes his piano playing. The group, as the head waiter, takes him to the table. Although they pass right by the piano and the woman, who is later to be identified as Ilsa Lund, looks directly at Sam. The latter will, with a conscious effort, keeps his eyes on the keyboard. Ilsa smiles slightly. Camera stops on Sam. After she has gone out of the scene, Sam steals a look in her direction. The head waiter seats Ilsa and goes out of the shot. Laszlo takes his, the chair opposite. He surveys the room with a sweeping glance. Two point show, please. Yes, Monsieur. I see no one of Garty's description. Victor, I, I feel somehow we shouldn't stay here. If we walk out so soon, it would only call attention to us. Perhaps Ugarte's in some other part of the cafe. Excuse me, but you look like a couple who are on their way to America. A small blonde man, later identified as Berger, walks into the scene. Well? The man reaches into his vest pocket and brings out a ring with a large aquamarine stone. You will find the market there for this ring. I am forced to sell it at a great sacrifice. Thank you, but I hardly think that... And perhaps for the lady. The ring is quite unique. He holds it down to their view, begins to twist the stone, which is apparently screwed into the setting. The stone comes loose in his fingers. In the setting underneath a gold plate is a faint impression of the Lorraine Cross of General de Gaulle. Yes, I am very interested. Good. What is your name? Berger. 
and at your service, sir. Victor. Meet me in a few minutes at the bar. I do not think we would want to buy the ring, but thank you for showing it to me. Burger takes the cue. He sighs and puts the ring away. Such a bargain. But if that is your decision... I'm sorry. It is. He bows and turns away. Camera pans as he walks away. He brushes by Captain Renal, who is approaching the table. He glances sharply at Berger as he passes. Then Renal beams as the camera pans back with him to the table. Renal. Mr. Laszlo, is it sure. not? Yes. Uh, <laughs> I am Captain Renault, Prefect of Police. Yes, what is it you want? I'm merely to welcome you to Casablanca and wish you a pleasant stay. It is not often we have so distinguished a visitor. Thank you. You will forgive me, Capitan, but the present French administration has not always been so cordial. May I present Miss Ilsa Lund? I was informed you are the most beautiful woman ever to visit Casablanca. That is a gross understatement. Elsa's man manner is friendly and reserved, her voice low and soft. You are very kind. Won't you join us? Uh, if you will permit me. Oh, Emil. Captain? Yes, Captain. <laughs> Uh, put the bottle of your best champagne and uh, put it on my bill. Very well, sir. No, Capitan, please. Uh, it is a little game we play. They put it on my bill and I tear the bill up. It is very convenient. <laughs> also laughs and glances off in Sam's direction. Captain. The boy who is playing the piano. Somewhere I have seen him. Some? Yes. Uh, he came from Paris with Rick. Rick? Who's he? Mademoiselle, you are in Rick's, and Rick is... Um, is what? Uh, well, well, Mademoiselle is kind of a man that... Uh, well, uh, if I were a woman... And I, uh, <laughs> you're not around. Um, I would be in love with Rick. <laughs> what, a, what a fool I am. I'm talking to a beautiful woman about another man. Oh. When all stops and looks <laughs> off, and then he jumps to his feet as Strasser enters. Oh, uh, excuse me, uh, Mademoiselle uh, Insta Lund, uh, Monsieur Laszlo, uh, may I present Major Heinrich Strasser? Strasser bows and smiles pleasantly. How do you do? It's a pleasure I have long looked forward to. There is not the slightest recognition from either Ilsa or Laszlo. Strasser waits to be asked to see himself. I'm sure you'll excuse me if I'm not so gracious, but you see, Major Strasser, I'm a Czechoslovakian. You were a Czechoslovakian. You are now a subject of the German Reich. I never accepted that privilege, and I'm now on French soil. I should like to discuss some matters arising from your presence on French soil. This is hardly the time or the place. Then we shall state another time and another place. Tomorrow at 10, at the prefect's office, in Mademoiselle, with Mademoiselle. Uh, Captain Renault, I am under your authority. Is it your order that we come to your office? Uh, let us say that it is my request. Uh, that is a much more pleasant word. Very well. Renault and Strasser rise, bow shortly to Laszlo and deeply to Ilsa. Mademoiselle. Mademoiselle. The camera pans with Renan Strasser as they walk away. A very clever tactical retreat measure. Strasser looks at Renal sharply, but sees only a non-committal smile on Renal's face. 
Laszlo watches after Strasser and Renal. He turns back to Ilsa with a slight smile. This time they really mean to stop me. Victor, I'm afraid for you. We have been in difficult places before, haven't we? He puts his hand over hers. Ilsa smiles back to him, but her eyes are still troubled. Overseen comes an orchestra fanfare. Dance floor. Sam stands up from his piano, holding his hands up for silence. Karina enters. Lights go off, and she starts the number. Sam plays the last chorus and looks toward Ilsa. Ilsa off. Ilsa watches Sam. Laszlo looks up about him with apparent casualness, finding himself unnoticed in the darkness of the room. He rises. We must find out what Berger knows. Be careful. I will. Don't worry. Ilsa nods. The camera pans with Laszlo as he crosses the room in corporate comparative darkness. Karina continues her number, Sam accompanying her on the piano. Sam gives a troubled look in Ilsa's direction. From Sam's angle, Ilsa is watching Sam. Ilsa continues to watch Sam. At the bar, Berger is sipping a drink. Overseen, we hear the sound of the Spanish entertainer. Laszlo walks into the shot, casually takes a place at the bar next to Berger. Monsieur Berger, the ring. Could I see the ring? Yes, monsieur. The champagne cocktail, please. As Sasha moves down the bar to make the cocktail, Laszlo takes out a cigarette. Berger leans over to give him a light. I recognize you from the news photographs, Monsieur Laszlo. In a concentration camp, one is apt to lose a little weight. We read five times that you are killed in five different places. Hmm. As you see, it was true every time. Thank heaven I found him, Berger. I'm looking for a man by the name of Ugarti. He is to help me. Monsieur Laszlo, Ugarte cannot even help himself. He is under arrest for murder. He was arrested here tonight. Ah, I see. But we who are still free will do all we can. We are organized, Monsieur, underground like everywhere else. Tomorrow night, there's a meeting. If, if you would come, I, you would love He stops as he sees Sasha bringing a drink to Laszlo. Will you ask the piano player to come over here, please? Very well, mademoiselle. Berger and Laszlo. At the bar, Renal comes up. How is the jewelry business, Berger? Uh, not so good. May I have my check, please? Uh, too bad you weren't here earlier, Monsieur Laszlo. Yeah, we had quite a bit of excitement this evening, didn't we, Berger? Oh, uh, yes. Excuse me, gentlemen. My bill. No. Two champagne cocktails, please. Yes, sir. Sam looks up, starter. Ilsa motions him to come over. Sam hesitates, starts to wheel the piano over. At the table, as Sam wheels in the piano, on his face is that funny fear. And to tell the truth, Ilsa herself is not as self-possessed as she tries to appear. There is something behind this, some mysterious, deep flowing feeling. Hello, sir. Hello, Miss Elsa. I never expected to see you again. It's been a long time. Yes, Miss Elsa. A lot of water under the bridge. He sits down and is ready to play. Some of the old songs, Sam. Yes, ma'am. Sam begins to play a number. He is nervous, waiting for anything. But even so, when it comes, he gives a little start. Where's Rick? I don't know. Ain't seen him at all night tonight. Elsa gives him a tolerant smile. Sam looks very uncomfortable. When will he be back? 
<sighs> Not tonight. Or he ain't coming. Does he always leave so early? He never, I mean, he's got a girl up at the blue parrot. He's does there all the time, all the time. Sam, he used to be a much better liar. Leave him alone. You're bad luck to him. Sam, say it once, for old time's sake. I don't know what you mean, Miss Elsa. Play it, Sam. Play it as, as time goes by. I can't remember it, Miss Elsa. Of course he can. He doesn't want to play it. He seems even more scared. I'll hum it for you. He begins to play it very softly. Sing it, Sam. And Sam sings. You must remember this. A kiss is still a kiss. A sigh is just a sigh. The fundamental Rick thing comes swinging out. Life. He has heard the music and is livid. <clears throat> Sam, I told you never to play it. He stops abruptly, stops speaking, and stops moving. From his perspective, Sam and Ilsa at the piano. Closer anger, angle, Sam and Ilsa. Sam looks over his shoulder at Rick and stops playing. Ilsa knows why, even before she turns and look. She knows who she'll see when she turns. She turns slowly. She isn't breathing much. Rick isn't breathing at all. It's a wallop, a shock. For a long moment, he just looks at her and you can tell what he is thinking. He starts moving forward, his eyes riveted on her. Camera trucks ahead of him, keeping him in close up as he moves across the cafe. Reverse Ango trucking shop moving in the direction. He is going straight for the piano. Elsa is looking directly at Rick too. Sam is plainly terrified. He puts his stool on top of the piano and wills up the piano quickly away. Elsa doesn't notice. She still looks at Rick. A couple of intercuts, Renal and Laszlo are approaching from the bar. At the table, Renal moves into the scene with Laszlo arm in arm. Well, uh, you are asking about Rick? Here he is. As Rick moves into the scene, um, um, may I present? Um, Hello, Rosa. Hello, Rick. She offers her hand. He takes it. Ah, oh, you've already met, met Rick, Ilsa. Uh, well, then perhaps. Uh, this you is Mr. Laszlo. How do you do? Yeah, how do you do? Elsa says Laszlo in a funny way, as if she's frightened to say it, and yet would rather say it herself than have someone else. Rick measures Laszlo with a look, then looks at Ilsa and smiles. You would say there is some uh, mockery in the way he smiles. One hears a great deal about Rick in Casablanca. Yeah, and about Victor Laszlo everywhere. Won't you join us for a drink? Oh, no, <laughs> no, Rick never drinks. She just I will. Uh, precedent is being broken. <laughs> uh, Emil! This is a most interesting cafe. I congratulate you. I congratulate you. And what for? Oh, uh, your work. Yeah, thank you. I try. We all try. You succeed. I can't get over you two. She was asking about you earlier, Rick, uh, in the way that made me extremely jealous. <laughs> I wasn't sure you were the same. Let's see. The last time we met. It was La Belle Aro. How nice. You remembered, but of course, that was the day the Germans marched into Paris. <laughs> well, not an easy day to forget, was it? No. I remember every detail. The jerk. 
Your man wore gray. You wore blue. Yeah. I put that dress away. When the Germans march out, I'll wear it again. Mm. Ricky, you're becoming quite human. I suppose we have to thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Ilsa, I don't want to be the one to say it, but it's late. Oh, so it is. Um, and we have a curfew here in Casablanca that would never do for the chief of police to be caught drinking after hours and uh, have to find himself. <laughs> nope, we haven't overstayed our welcome. Not at all. Your check, sir. Oh, it's my party. Oh, another president for him. This has been a most interesting evening. I call you a cab. We'll uh, come again. Anytime. Will you say goodnight to Sam for me? I will. There's still nobody in the world who can play as time goes by like Sam. Well, he hasn't played it for a long time. A pause. Elsa smiles. Good night. Good night. Good night. Rick and Laszlo nod good night to each other. Laszlo and Elsa start to the door, Renal with them. Rick watches them go. The revolving door is heard turning. The three come out of the cafe. Renal walks through shot to the curb and is heard to blow his whistle. Laszlo lights a cigarette, speaks very casually. Very puzzling fellow, this Rick. What sort is he? Elsa doesn't look at him. With an effort, she keeps her voice steady. Oh, I really can't say. Though I saw him quite often in Paris. A cab is heard to draw. Elsa moves forward out of the shot. Laszlo follows her. Tomorrow at 10 at the prefect's office. We'll be there. Good night. Good night. Good night. Cameron pans up the sign to Rick's. The sign now dark, illuminated only as the resolving beacon from the airport strikes it. The customers have all gone. The house lights are out. Rick sits at a the table. There is a jigger glass of bourbon on the table directly in front of him and another glass empty on the table before an empty chair. Near at, the, near, near at hand is a bottle from which this one drink exactly has been poured. Rick just sits, staring at the drink. His face is entirely expressionless. During the following scene, the beacon continues its gyration, picking up first one, then the other of its sweep around the room. The effect should create a move of unreality that will make the flashback a plausible device. Sam comes in. He stands hesitantly before Rick. Boss. Boss. Yes. You going to bed, boss? Not right now. Sam looks at Rick closely, realizes Rick is in a grim mood. You plan on going to bed in the near future? No. You even going to go to bed? No. I ain't sleepy either. Good, have a drink. Not me. Hey. Don't have a drink. Boss, let's get out of here. No, sir. I'm waiting for a lady. Please, boss. Let's go. There's nothing but you here. She's coming back. I know she's coming back. Boss, we'll car, we'll drive all night, we'll get drunk, we'll go fishing and we'll 
stay out until she's gone. You shut up and go home, will you? Uh, I'm staying right, right here. Sam sits down at the piano and starts to play softly. Suddenly, Vic bursts out. He grab Ugarte and he walks in. Uh, that's the way it goes. One in, one out. <clears throat> Sam. Yeah, boss. Sam, uh, it's December in Casablanca. What time is it? What time is it in New York? My watch stopped. Yeah. <clears throat> well, um, <clears throat> lost the script on the page. Okay, you're reading it. All yeah, right. Uh, bottom of sixty-one. Bottom of sixty-one. One. Uh, share it again. I stopped sharing it so My see everybody's stopped. faces. I was told we only could see four. Uh, mm, uh, uh, mm, I bet they're asleep in New York. I bet they're asleep all over America. <laughs> of all the gin joints and all the towns and all the world, she walks in the mine. What is that you playing? A little something of my own. Well, stop it. You know what I want to hear. No, I don't. Oh, you played it for her, and you can play it for me. Well, I don't think I can remember it. If she can stand it, I can. Play it. Yes, boss. Sam starts to play as time goes by. He pours a drink as Sam plays. From his expression, we know that he is thinking of the past. A montage and flashback. Flashbacks. Paris. The following shots are superimposed on the background of stock shots. Cramps Elise. Rick is driving a small open car slowly along the boulevard, close besides him. With his arm linked to his, sits Ilsa. Excursions boat. On the scene, night. An orchestra is playing French music by themselves at the rail. The boats stand, Rick and Ilsa. They are transported by the night, by the music, by each other. Interior, Rick's Paris apartment. Ilsa at the window fixes flowers. Rick opens champagne. Ilsa joins him. Who are you really? What were you before? What did you do? What did you we think? said no questions. <laughs> they drink. Interior went Paris Cafe. Rick and Ilsa dancing. Ilsa's Paris apartment. Rick and Ilsa on. Well, Frank, for your thoughts? In America, they don't need to bring a penny. Be about all their worth, I guess. I'm willing to be overcharged. <laughs> Come on, tell me. I was just wondering yes. um, why I was so lucky. Why I should find you waiting for me to come along. Why there is no other man in my life. <laughs> Rick nods. Well, that's easy. There was. He's dead. Oh, I'm sorry for asking. I forgot we said no questions. Well, only one answer can take care of all our questions. She kisses him. Right. The street stupefied people are staring from their windows into the street. The camera comes to rest on a loudspeaker wagon around which is clustered a group of frightened and French people. A harsh German voice is barking out the tra tragic news of the Nazi push towards Paris. Parisians are being told 
how to act when the conquerors march in. Two shot. Rick and Lee, Elsa. Talking about something now. Wednesday, Thursday at the latest, I'll be in Paris. Richard, they'll find out your record. It won't be safe for you here. I'm on their blacklist already. They're a roll of honor. Okay. In the Montemere, sign over the cafe, La Belle Aurore. Sam playing at the piano as time goes by, blending in with the background music. He looks happily over his shoulder. Playing as time goes by, Ilsa is leaning on the piano, listening. Nobody else is in the room. Everyone being in the street, listening to the loudspeaker. Ilsa's attitude as she listens is very distraught. There is evidently something on her mind, and it isn't at all concerned with the war. Rick, bearing a champagne bottle and glasses, comes into the scene. His manner is worry, but not the bitter weariness we have seen in Casablanca. Henri wants us to finish this bottle and then three more. He says the water is garden with champagne before he lets the Germans drink any of it. He hands a glass to Ilsa and Sam. This sort of takes the sting out of being occupied, doesn't it, Mick? You said it. <laughs> he was looking at you, kid. A shout is heard from the people in the street. Rick and Ilsa look at each other, then hurry to the window. At the open window, as Rick and Elsa come into the scene, a loudspeaker is blaring in German. <clears throat> uh, my German's a little uh, rusty. It's the, it, it's the Gestapo. They say expect to be in Paris tomorrow. They're telling us how to act when they come marching in. They are silent, depressed. With the whole world crumbling, we picked this time to fall in love. <laughs> Yeah, pretty bad timing. Who were you 10 years ago? 10 years ago? Let's see. Oh, yes. I was having a brace put in my teeth. Where were you? I was looking for a job. Pause. Elsa looks at him tenderly. Rick takes her in his arms, kisses her hungrily. While they are locked in and embrace, the dull boom of cannons is heard. Rick and Ilsa separate. Was that cannon fire or just my heart pounding? <clears throat> that was the new German 75. I'm judging by the sound about 35 miles away. Oh, <clears throat> and a little closer every minute. Here, here, drink up. We'll never finish the other three. Coming into the scene. Sam? Them Germans will be here mighty soon. They'll come and they're in for you. There's a head. Elsa reacts to this wordly. I left a note in my apartment. They'll know where to find me. Sam shrugs helplessly, goes. Elsa looks at Rick. It's strange, Rick. I really know so very little about you. I know very little about you. Just the fact that you had your teeth straightened. But be serious, darling. You are in danger. You must leave Paris. No. No, no. We must leave. Yes, of course. We. we. Trains for Marseille leave at 5. I'll pick you up at the hotel at 4.30. No, not at the hotel. I have things to do in the city before I leave. I'll meet you at the station. Huh? All right. At a quarter to five. Say, so, why don't we get married in Marseille? That's too far ahead to plan. Hey, yeah, that's too far ahead. Well, let's see. Uh, about the engineer? Why can't he marry us on the train? Oh, darling. Why not? Captain's on a ship can. It doesn't seem fair that... Uh... <laughs> Suddenly, Ilsa starts to cry softly. Hey. Hey, what's, what's wrong, kid? I love you so much, and I hate this war so much. 
oh, Rick, it's a crazy world. Anything can happen. If you shouldn't get away, if if something should keep us apart, wherever they put you, wherever I'll be, I want you to know that I kiss me, kiss me as though, as though it were the last time. He looks into her eyes, then kisses her as though it were the last time. Over the scene, Sam is again playing as time goes by. There is a hectic, fevered excitement evident in the faces we pass. This is the last train from Paris. The camera stops on Rick, who is glancing at his watch, then up at the clock. It is two minutes before train time. Rain is pouring over his head and shoulders, but he seems not to notice. Suddenly, Sam appears with an envelope clasped in his hand. Where is she? Have you seen her? No, no, Mr. Richard. I, I can't find She done checked out for the hotel, boss. But this here's no, just after you left. Rick grabs the letter. He fumbles as he tries to open it. The envelope frights him. At this moment, the train pulls into the station. There is a hubbub among the crowd. Finally, Rick gets the envelope open, stares down at the letter. The letter which reads, from Ilsa. Richard, you want to I cannot go with you or ever see you again. You must not ask why, just believe that I love you. Go, my darling, and God bless you, Ilsa. Boss, that's all the last call. Boss, do, do you hear me? Come on, Mr. Richards, get on there. Let's go. Come on, Mr. Richard. The rain drops pour down on the letter, smudging the writing. The train gives a long, mournful whistle. With the hourglass changing into the drink, camera pulls back and moves up close up on Rick. He still stares at the drink. There is no sound on, of music now, utter stillness. Sam has gone home. The circle of the light passes over Rick's face and sweeps out of the scene. Only by a flicker on his face do we follow the light around the room. The next time it passes, Rick's eyes are caught by the light and his head turns following it. Camera pans with the light. The circle reaches the door. Ilsa is standing in the doorway. The camera remains on her. The circle passes and in and is in darkness. It is hard to tell to see that she is still there. Rick is staring at the doorway. It is probably that at first he thinks it is his imagination that it is playing tricks on him. The light sweeps over him again. His expression hardens. Elsa at the doorway in the darkness. Rick. As she starts forward, the light passes over her. Her face is eager and pleading. Rick gets half to his feet as she enters the scene. The light sweeps by. Rick, I have to talk to you. Her manner is a little uncertain, a little tentative, but with a quiet determination beneath it. Oh, I uh, saved my first drink there with you, here. No, no, Rick, not tonight. She sits down in the chair before the empty glass. Her eyes are searching his face, but there's no expression on it except a cold and impassive one. He sits down too. He reaches for her glass and half gestures with it toward her. Especially night. She drains the glass and is reaching for the bottle, pours himself another drink. She watches this with a look which says that she wishes he wouldn't drink tonight. Please don't. Why did you have to come to Casablanca? There were other places. I wouldn't have come if I had known that you were here. Believe me, Rick, that's the truth. I didn't know. <laughs> Funny about your voice. Now it hasn't changed. I can still hear it. Rick, dear, I'll go with you any place. We'll get a train together and we'll never stop. Please don't. Don't, Rick. I can understand how you feel. <laughs> you understand how I feel. How long was it we had, honey? I didn't count the days. 
Well, I did. Right, every one of them. Mostly, I, I remember the, the last one. A wow finish. A guy standing on the station platform in the rain with a comical look on his face because his insides had been kicked out. Can I tell you a story? Nick? Has it got a wow finish? I don't know the finish yet. Well, go on, tell it. Maybe one will come to you as you go along. It's about a girl who had just come to Paris from her home in Ohio, in Oslo. At the house of some of some friends, she met a man about whom she'd heard her whole life, a very great and courageous man. He opened up for her a whole beautiful world of knowledge and thoughts and ideals. Everything she ever knew or ever became was because of him. And she looked up at him and worshipped him with a feeling she supposed was love. Uh, yes, that was very pretty. I heard a story once. In fact, I heard a lot of stories in my time. They went along with the sound of a tiny piano in a parlor downstairs. Mister, I met a man once when I was only a kid. They'd always begin. Huh. Elster, sh shut yeah. Get up. I guess neither one of our stories was very funny. Tell me, who was it you left me for? Was it Laszlo, or, or were there others in between? Or, or, or aren't you that kind that tells? Ilsa, tears in her eyes. She stops in the doorway, looks back at him. Then she turns and walks out. Rick, his head slumps over the table. Gradually, his body sags over the table. The glass tips over, spilling its contents over the cloth. Fade out. Fade in into Renault's office, day. Strasser is with Renal. I strongly suspect that Andante left the letters uh, of transit with her blame. I would suggest searching the cafe immediately and thoroughly. If they have the letters, he is much too smart to let us find them there. You give him credit for too much cleverness. My impression was that he's just another blundering American. Quite so, but we mustn't underestimate American blundering. I was with them when they blundered into Berlin in 1910. Strasser looks at him. As to Laszlo, we want him watched 24 hours a day. It may interest you to know that at this very moment, he is on his way here. Exterior prefecture of the police. People are packed around the entrance. Laszlo and Ilsa make their way through the jam. Shooting from in back of the desk towards the door as it is opened by the native officer who ushers in Laszlo and Ilsa, both Vinal and Strasser in the foreground, rise facing the couple as they walk in. Renal moves forward to offer Ilsa his hand. I am delighted to see you both. Laszlo bows to both men, but offers a sh to shake hands with neither. Ilsa bows to Strasser and Renel, offers her a chair. Uh, did you have a good night's rest? I have slept very well. That's strange. No one is supposed to sleep well in Casablanca. <laughs> <laughs> May we proceed with the business? Very well, Monsieur Laszlo. We will not mince words. You are an escaped prisoner of the Reich. So far, you have been fortunate to elude us. You have reached Casablanca. It is my duty to see that you stay in Casablanca. Whether or not you succeed is, of course, problematical. Not at all. Captain Renault's signature is necessary on every exit visa. Captain, would you think it is possible that Mr. Laszlo will receive a visa? I'm afraid not. I regret, Monsieur. Very well, perhaps I shall like it in Casablanca. And Mademoiselle? 
You need not be concerned with me about me. Is that all you wish to tell me? Do not be in such a hurry. You have all the time in the world. You may be in Casablanca indefinitely. Or you may be in Lisbon tomorrow on one condition. And that is? You know the leader of the underground movement in Prague, in Paris, in Amsterdam, in Brussels, in Oslo, in Belgrade, in Athens. Even in Berlin? Yes, even in Berlin. If you will furnish me with their names and their expected whereabouts, you will have your visa in the morning. And the honor of having served the Third Reich. And I was in a German concentration camp for a year. That is honor enough for a lifetime. Will you give us the names? If I didn't give them to you in a concentration camp where you had more uh, persuasive methods at your disposal, I certainly will not give them to you now. And what if you tracked down these men and killed them? What if you murdered all of us from every corner of Europe? Hundreds of thousands would rise up to take our places. Even Nazis can kill that fast. Monsieur Laszlo, you have a reputation for eloquence, which I can now understand. But in one respect, you are mistaken. You said the enemies of the Reich could all be replaced. But there's one exception. You take your, uh, no one can take your place. In the event of anything, or unfortunate should uh, occur uh, to you while you are trying to escape. You won't dare to interfere with me here. This is still unoccupied France. Any violation of neutrality will reflect on Captain Renault. Monsieur, in so far as it is in my power. Thank you. By the way, uh, last night you evinced an interest in Signor Ugarte? Yes. I believe you have a message for him? Uh, nothing important, but may I speak to him now? You would find the conversation a trifle one-sided. Signor Ugarte is dead. Laszlo and Ilsa look at each other. Ah. I am making out the report now. We haven't quite decided yet whether he committed suicide or died trying to escape. You are quite finished with us? For the time being. Good day. As Ilsa and Laszlo leave, the young officer comes in when the door has closed on Ilsa and Laszlo. Undoubtedly, their next step will be to the black market. Excuse me, Captain. Another visa problem has come up. <laughs> Show the hell in. Yes, Monsieur. The black market, a cluttered Arab street and bazaars, shops and stalls, all kinds of Races and people are milling about the merchandise. Native dealers out on an outdoor display, both men and women are dressed in tropical clothes. The canopies over the stairs give them some protection of the scorching sun. On the surface of the atmosphere is merely languid, but there is a sinister undercurrent of illicit trade. The camera moves along the row of stalls toward disreputable building at the head of the market, over the entrance of the building is a faded sign, Blue Parrot Cafe. Overseeing, we hear hypnotic sound of a single flute. During the progress, though through the marketplace, the camera picks up the following fragmented scenes. An American is talking to a food vendor. The American looks a little confused. The camera moves on to a rug stall. The dealer is holding up a small Persian rug in an effort to sell it to an English couple. Are you sure that this is perfectly legal? 
Madame, there is no rug in my shop that has not been smuggled in in legally. You see, the authorities have been moved. Uh, the camera moves on to the Blue Parrot Cafe near the entrance. A Frenchman and native are talking together in low tones. But Monsieur, we would have to handle the police. That is a job for Senor Ferrari. Ferrari. It can be most helpful to know Senor Ferrari. He's pretty near got a monopoly on the black market here. Senior Ferrari comes out, looks impatiently up and down the street. The native and the man. You will find them over there at the Blue Parrot. Oh, thanks. Senior Ferrari is about to go back into the cafe when Anita and Jan walk up to him. Excuse me, are you're not uh, Senior Ferrari, are you not? Yes. Uh, you, we were told that you might be able to help us. Ferrari looks at them for a moment before answering. Come in. He leads the way into the blue parrot. A huge frame is rolling with laughter. <laughs> 500 francs Camera. for extra visa. Camera pulls back to reveal Jan and Anina standing like frightened children before Ferrari in his private office. Young man, in Casablanca, 500 francs will buy you a pound of sugar, but not an extra pizza. But, Signor Ferrari, that is all we have left. What can we do? Perhaps if you had a talk with Captain Renal. We have already talked with him. She takes her husband's arm, preparatory to leaving. I'm sorry, that, that is all I can suggest. The camera pans with them as they walk to the door. At the Blue Parrot Cafe, much less pretentious than Rick's, the bar is well populated, but there are only a few people at the tables. Rick comes into the scene, walks toward Ferrari. He is wearing his usual deadpan. As Rick comes into the scene, the door opens and Ferrari comes out, ushering out Jan and Nina, who look very downhearted. There, there. Don't be too downhearted. Perhaps you can come to terms with Captain Renault. Thank you very much, senor. He leads Anina away. Rick watches as the couple, the couple as they move towards the door. Then he walks in the direction of Ferrari. Rick walks into the shot. Hello, hello, Rick's Ferrari. Senior Ferrari turns around, pleased to see Rick. Good morning, Rick. Let's see, the bus is in. I'll take my shipment with me. No hurry. I shall have it sent over. Have a drink with me. Uh, I never drink in the morning. And every time you send my shipment over, it's a little short. <laughs> Carrying charges, my friend. Carrying charges. Here, sit down. There's something I want to talk over with you anyhow. Uh, the bourbon. The news about Ugarte upset me very much. Sure, fat hypocrite. You don't feel any sorrier for Ugarte than I do. Of course not. What upsets me is the fact that Ugarte is dead, and no one knows where those letters of transit are. Practically no one. If I could lay my hands on those letters, I could make a fortune. So could I. And I'm a poor businessman. I have a, a proposition for whoever has those letters. I will handle the entire transaction, get rid of the letters, take all the risk for a small percentage. And carry the charges? <laughs> Naturally. There will be a few incidental expenses. That is the proposition I have for whoever has those letters. I'll tell him when he comes in. Rick. I'll put my cards on the table. I think you know where those letters are. <laughs> well, you're in good company, Renault. And Strasser probably thinks so too. I came here to give them a chance to ransack my place. Rick, don't be a fool. Take me into your confidence. I need a partner.
But Rick isn't listening to him. He is looking through the open door in the direction of the linen bazaar. Ilsa and Laszlo have passed there in front of the linen bazaar. Laszlo leaves Ilsa and is walking towards the Blue Parrot Cafe. Rick and Senior Ferrari. Excuse me. I'll be getting back. All right, you guys, I think this is a good time for us to have an intermission. See if anyone has to go to the restroom, take a break, discuss some things. So I will put on the intermission screen. Awesome so far, guys. This is so much fun. Oh, love this. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Super fun. Hope all you viewers are liking this too.
All right, as intermission is over, it has been decided that we shall end this reading for now and hopefully we pick up a part two. If not, we encourage everyone that went this far, if you're following along, that you continue to read the end of the script on your own and get to see what that experience is like. Um, so I think we should Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Good job. Here's nice. looking at you, so kids. So good. Woo. So good. Here's looking at all of you kids. All right. Oh, yeah. continue. <laughs> yeah, it, yes. he continued. All I got to say is, man, my heart goes out to Rick right now. <laughs> man, getting left on the train, that's <laughs> harsh, dude. You guys got to see Whoa, how this Rick. ends. If you haven't watched yeah. the movie, you got to read how it ends because it may not be what you expect. How's that yeah, lifting? Well, I, we I, left I, you guys I, on. Did anyone else die in this reading? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's why we're cutting the shirts short so no one else dies. Right. All right. Uh, I know we all get to live another day. Tomorrow. Yes. And we get to read more scripts another day. Um, so uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, let's go around the room. And if there's anything you guys want to plug or where people can find you and see more of your stuff. Uh, so we'll start in the top corner and go down. So, Ash. Yes, um, I am currently doing a theater play. So if you're in Alberta, Canada, for some reason, at the end of this month, you can come see that. Otherwise, I'm on Twitch at Ashromer, and I stream there. And I'm on Twitter, Ashromer, as well. Sweet. Thank you. Follow her, everybody. Go see her if you're in Alberta. All right, Mary Lou. Um, I'm just doing normal auditions and for television in Vancouver right now. Um, I'm on Facebook and I'm on Instagram and it's just Mary Lou Drakenberg. Nothing special. Wonderful. Wonderful. Tony, anything you want to plug? I am going to be filming a series here shortly um, in Kingman, Arizona. And uh, as soon as that comes up, I'll be posting it on Facebook and Instagram and all the fun places you can find me there at uh, Tony Flora. All right, cool. And if you have that, we'll update that as a link in the description below. Craig, well, I just finished directing two plays, so I'm taking a taking a break for now. However, I will be in a movie called Ninety Minute Drive that was done by a student at the Red Deer Polytechnic, and that should be coming out soon. Awesome. And Andrew, hey. Uh, I'm Andrew Garrett. Uh, if you care to, you can look at my IMDb. It's just Andrew Garrett. Um, I kind of don't have any other social media or I could start listing my credits, but it might be hard to <laughs> might get kind of embarrassing. So if you're interested, just <clears throat> IMDb. We'll check you Thanks, out man. on IMDb. So, so fun to be here. <laughs> and we'll have that link in the description as well. Justin Dobby. Uh, I am currently on my couch. But I do have this really sweet gig coming up in about 30 minutes called Sleeping Man Number One. It involves me and a pillow, and it's just the best thing ever. Uh, so <laughs> I'm on all the socials at Justin Dobby, D A U B E. -E. All right. And Angelina Peterson. Hi. I have an IMDb under Angel Peterson, and I'm on Facebook, and I have a new business uh, making custom film documentaries and it's called your adored life so that's on facebook it's fun very cool clint hey guys um my name is clint monroe you can find me on facebook and instagram uh, i'm still trying to build those up right now but both of them you can find me at clint monroe clint is in clint eastwood M monroe is in Marilyn monroe 2017 um at gmail.com you can find me it's a picture of my dog on a little surfboard i was trying to teach him to surf i'm in california what are you gonna do um anyways i'm just getting started i love all of this i want to get plugged in i want to learn everything i got i just want to be a sponge i've got a couple big 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 stories that i'm working on uh as far as writing's concerned uh but i just want to learn everything man like i want to be a part of this um it's been something i wanted to do since i was a little kid and i just got you know, went down the wrong path for 33 years, but you know, you're never too old to start, I guess, you know, that new excitement and uh, passion, like contagious. I'm yeah, 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 now. for sure. All right. I know it's getting late. Uh, but yeah, Jason Steele. 
the master yeah. of costumes. <laughs> just <kidding>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just love doing costume changes at these things, you know, and it just keeps it interesting for sure. Um, Absolutely. So, yeah, I, uh, I've got a website, uh, porcupinefilmproductions.com uh, or porcupineproductions.ca. Either one of those goes to the same place. Um, and I produce and direct film stuff. So uh, my latest, I think it should be up on there now, is uh, Cheaters, Robbers, and Outlaws. It's a Western short. And then I did a couple of documentaries I was involved with over the summer. So those will be coming out in the next, I don't know, few months. Um, yeah. So that's me. Excellent. And a great Mackenzie Con. Uh, hi, everybody. Thanks so much for tuning in and and thank you my fellow my fellow co-actors that was super fun um you can find me at all the places at mackenzie Khan, spelled how it is uh i'm available for hire talk to me hire me yes <laughs> thank you <laughs> she's been on a few of my short films i can say she's very professional fantastic I've been in some stuff. Uh, also, if you guys need some yeah. soundtracks for your awesome movies or some uh, music made, I'm also available for that. All right, great. And I have a website, jacobpatrick.com. But more than that, just come back here to Table Read Tuesdays. I'll try and get a table read more uh, streamlined, but out every single week. All right. Um, follow all these great actors. And thank you, everybody that watches. You know, share with everyone, and we'll see you soon. See right. you guys. Bye. Bye. We'll always have Bye. Paris. Yeah. yeah, you're looking at you kids. I think this is the oh, beginning long. of a beautiful yeah. friendship. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>